You know, one of the really interesting things about classic ocean liners like the Titanic or the Queen Mary is just how much of the ship sits underwater. This is known as the ship's draft, the distance from the waterline to the keel, the ship's backbone. Queen Mary had an incredible 39 foot or almost 12 meter draft. That's about the height of a three story building. But one thing you might have noticed in pictures and paintings is the striking color, red. We all know, even subconsciously, that ships seem to always be painted red below the waterline. But why? I mean, ships exist at sea, why not paint it blue or green or something nautical? Is it to hide rust or some kind of weird ages old tradition that's still followed blindly today? Well, it's an interesting story, or at least I think it is. So sit back and relax as I, your friend, Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, explain why ships are painted red. Ships sail on the sea. I know, it's a shocking revelation. It's a very unstable and unpredictable environment. It's actually more unpredictable than Melbourne's weather. If you're from here, you'll understand that one. Waves can run stories tall and strip the paint from bare steel. Salt crusts and deposits rusts anything that isn't painted and turns it brown. Seawater rots wood and fabric. It's a harsh, unfriendly environment, but a select few mad humans have been going out to the sea for centuries. The Mariner, a strange specimen of humankind, seems to enjoy this bizarre kind of lifestyle, so when they set out to sea like their ancestors did, back in the 1500s through to the 1800s, their ships were fairly simple. They relied on the wind to get their speed, but they were made out of timber. Fairly dense and reliable timber too, like oak, teak or mahogany, but old-timey shipbuilders encountered a few unique problems. See, getting across the ocean as quickly as possible was a big deal in the centuries before steam engines and airplanes, so every single bit of speed that could be squeezed out of a ship's design was paramount. Pretty early on, sailors realised that ships sitting in harbours waiting to be loaded or overhauled began to gather unwanted inhabitants. Yes, of course there were rats, but below the waterline something strange was happening. Seaweed, barnacles and thick marine growth it began to build up on the ship's hull. Aesthetically speaking, nobody really cared, but it had a huge impact on the ship's speed. With clumps of marine growth on the hull, the ship couldn't as easily slice through the water. It would slow down. So ships had to regularly be scraped clean of these unwanted hitchhikers. It was a problem back in 1600, and it remains a problem today. It's hilarious to think that with all these years of technological advancement, even in the golden age of the ocean liner, the mammoth luxury ships like Queen Mary had to be regularly docked and scraped clean. But in the days of sail, it wasn't just marine growth that had to be stopped. The ship itself had to be protected from being eaten away. Shipworms are a nasty little thing, technically a kind of mollusk that eats ships, specifically the wood that was used to build them. Back in the day, sailing ships were made of timber, and over time, these little critters would burrow in and do some serious damage. The ancient Greeks had this issue. Their fancy wooden ships were being eaten away below the waterline, so they started attaching lead plates for protection, but by the days of sail, lead in contact with iron bolts would cause galvanic corrosion, so something else had to be used. The answer was copper, and sailing ships had thin copper plates nailed onto their wooden hulls. The copper could be easily replaced, and the ships would still need to be dry docked for scraping to get all those nasty barnacles off, but at least now shipworms had been mostly defeated. And that's why, in a lot of paintings and pictures, ships from the golden age of sail either have a golden colour at their waterline, or kind of like a milky green colour, because as copper ages in water, it turns green. Nowadays, shipwrecks from that period often have their wood long gone, eaten away by sea creatures and bacteria, and all that's left behind is the copper sheathing that once would have protected it. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked as usual. By the time iron and steel hulled ships had come along, the copper sheathing wasn't necessary anymore because shipworm can't burrow into metal. But using metal hulls presented new and exciting challenges for ships builders and operators. For one thing, marine growth was still a thing, but now ships were getting bigger and bigger and scraping them would have to be a less common occurrence. Not only that, but steel and iron rust. They corrode in water, which means an unprotected hull would be eaten away and the ship could sink. The answer was very simple, and any ex-Navy personnel watching this can confirm that the old adage is, it's rusted, you paint it. But paint it with what? You can't just use something like a house paint, that stuff would be stripped right off by the water. No, a special kind of thick, protective paint would need to be used, and one was developed that could serve two special purposes. And guess what colour it was? It was back in 1865 when a chap named Heinrich Ratjen from Germany 
patented a paint formula that was designed specifically to protect the underside of ships' hulls. By this point, iron-hulled ships were everywhere, and a number of formulas had been put forward to varying degrees of success, as many as 300 of them. But Ratyan's mixture would be in use from 1865 for decades, and it wasn't just any ordinary old kind of paint, because its tenth ingredient was arsenic. Ratyan's formula used these ingredients. Wood alcohol or methylated spirits, shellac, thick turpentine, linseed oil, common rosin, which is a kind of resin, galley pot, which is another kind of resin, tar spirit, tallow, Venetian red, remember this one, arsenic, zinc oxide, and mercury oxide. Now, those are some pretty serious ingredients. Using shellac and two kinds of resin meant that the paint would be insanely hardy once allowed to dry and set in place, and the arsenic and mercury oxide would make the paint toxic to marine life. Barnacles and marine growth wouldn't accumulate because they'd be poisoned. Over time, the paint would need to be touched up, of course, but it would mean ships' undersides would need to be scraped way less often. It's that ninth ingredient, though, Venetian red, that gave the formula its colour. Venetian red is a pigment, the colour of paint, that dates back to ancient times for one simple reason. It's naturally occurring. It's made from iron oxide that you can find in rocks. Because of that, it is insanely abundant and crazy cheap to make. It's been used in everything, from cave paintings to medieval art. In the 1600s, the British Army began to use it to dye their jackets for easy identification in battle. This was the birth of the infamous redcoats, a tradition that continues to this day. Venetian red is extremely durable. The whole point of the paint formula was durability, after all. The ships would be expected to go many months in between dry docking and repainting, so the paint had to last. The formula, the mixture of durable pigments and oxides, resulted in a red paint that protected the ships from corrosion and marine growth and greatly increased their durability, and the special paint was called anti-fouling. So now you have a striking colour that is born out of necessity, but pretty soon it becomes tradition. Ships' hulls just become red. Some companies even begin to use it as a branding tool. Despite the hardiness of the paint, the waterline around a ship is an area of a lot of action. Tugboats, lighters and tenders, they all bump and scrape along the ship's hull. Very often, in the golden days of ocean liners, that area ended up looking like a real mess. The Cunard line didn't like this about their ships in the late 1800s. They wanted theirs to look the smartest in the world, so they introduced a thing called a boot topping. A boot topping is an added layer of paint in any colour that sits on top of the anti-fouling because it looks good. Anti-fouling on ships isn't a bright red, it's a kind of dull, rusty colour. But Cunard Line wanted their ships to look special, so they introduced a bright red boot topping with a thin white line. On photos of their ships in dry dock, you can just see where the anti-fouling ends and the boot topping begins. They emphasised this in their postcards and their posters with bright red waterlines and smart Cunard red funnels, the ships looked very smart indeed. This is a tradition that Cunard continues to this day. Queen Mary II, the only operational ocean liner in the world, sails with a bright red boot topping sitting on top of her anti-foul. Other ships have used some strange boot topping colours. At one point, the Queen Elizabeth II had a blue boot topping, which the public hated so much that Cunard Line changed it right back to red. In the 50s and 60s, Orient Line's ships used a green boot topping. Hell, most cruise ships today show a blue boot topping at the waterline. You might think the whole underside is blue, but it's just for looks. Get the cruise ship in dry dock, and most of the time you'll find it's all an illusion, and the underside is that same old dull red. Of course, nowadays, there are so many pigments and choices that a ship's anti-foul can really be painted any colour. But using a naturally occurring pigment like Venetian Red is the cheapest option. And after all, why break with tradition? Of course, using arsenic and modern-day anti-foul is generally frowned upon. There are a whole host of biocides used in anti-fouling of modern ships. Poisons designed to kill marine growth before it can grow on the hull. Occasionally, though, a biocide is deemed too harmful and it's banned. This year, a biocide called Cybertrine was banned in ships because studies found that it was building up and was, surprise surprise, extremely toxic to marine animals and organisms. Nowadays, organic biocides are preferred, but it's shocking what we've put into the ocean in the quest to prevent our ships from rusting. Everything from heavy metals to lead and arsenic to the pesticide DDT. So why are ships red? Well, because it's cheap, it's durable, and now it's a tradition. After all, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.